The residents of the community are not just children, the elderly, and those that have established a family. There are also young people who are transitioning into adults and preparing to start a family. The community has its own way of accommodating the needs and rights of these soon-to-be home founders. <laughs> In the Awaramba community, marriage is between two consenting adults. Before marriage, sex is not allowed. Girls have to be 19 and boys have to be 20 before they can get married. The one-to-one -one marriage between two consenting adults is needed for moral, legal and family reasons. If I want to marry someone there is no inhibition. We know each other very well from an early age. We have grown up together. Either I can propose to the man or the man could propose to me. If one is shy to propose he can send a go-between to do the proposing. We believe in the importance of marriage and we need to be careful about whom we marry. With marriage kids follow. The kids must grow up with their father and mother in a good environment with freedom. So, choosing a partner needs care. For me, the first criterion for choosing a partner is her willingness to discuss issues. Based on this principle and knowing she is open to discussion about the issues that we face in life, I have consented to her proposal. We have said marriage is between two persons. It is the free decision of the opposite sexes. In our community young girls and boys are free to choose their partners in life. If they love each other no one will interfere. The reason for the insistence on free choice is that if you force someone into a marriage, it won't last. Then separation will follow and if there are children from a broken marriage, then they will suffer. Kids want to live with both parents. They don't want to lose one of them and parents will suffer because they have to live without their children. On the point of getting married, if we want, we can ask our parents to take responsibility and they can take over and do it in a traditional way. After they got our consent, that is. On my part, it is me who proposed to him and my parents are happy about my choice of a husband. In this community, there is no dowry or wedding ceremony this was decided a long time ago when our parents decided with Sumra to establish this community. They have discussed all marriage-related issues. Dowry was seen as a barrier to not allowing couples not being able to get married based on pure love. If one family demands an unaffordable dowry, then the marriage will not take place. This was used to encourage abduction. So, our parents got rid of dowry. On the issue of a lavish wedding feast, our parents had decided it is a waste of meager resources, time, and labor. Instead, if parents have extra resources they can provide the newlywed with things they need to make their new life easy. In our Amba, marriage and a shared life between two people takes place in the context of a society that has accepted the equality of the sexes, in theory as well as in practice. And that takes pride in the fact that one of its main organising five principles is gender equality. Equality of the sexes is not just in the privacy of your home, but at the workplace as well as in the wider space of the community and its institutions. We believe and practice that all human beings are our siblings. Out of the 12 committees that run everyday life in the community, nine are chaired by women including the all-encompassing development committee, several factories such as the spiced cooking ingredients and health food, clinics, financial institutions such as Aramba Microfinance, whose deputy chair of the board is a woman. The prevalence of these socio-economic conditions has helped get rid of divorce in the main in society. For centuries, the struggle of women for genuine equality all over the world has not culminated in real equality in vast spaces and reverses have often manifested themselves in societies that have achieved progress on the front. Our Amba society takes pride in the fact that real equality has taken place in practice, including the all-important economic equality. Our Amba society is not just preoccupied with work and having fun all the time. Like any other society, it has its fair share of death and birth that is part of the general cycle of life everywhere. Our Amba's approach to death is as unique as its approach to life. It is a natural state of life that you come to this world and then you eventually depart. 
It is a matter of time, but it is humanity's fate. When we lose someone, we really get saddened because we have lived with this person with love and affection. We have shared the ups and downs of our life together. Yet when we lose someone, we don't do what other communities do, that is invite lots of people from outside the community to mourn with us. We have enough members to perform all the funeral rites. We have our own cemetery where those who have lived their life in dignity will rest in dignity. Only people that are needed to prepare for funeral rites will go to the site initially. Not the whole community. Most of the rest of the community accompanies the hearth to the funeral and afterwards stays behind to console the family of the deceased. We tell them it is God that brought the deceased to this earth, and it is his right to take back what he has given. We accept that death is the most certain of all our fates. Of course, we shed bitter tears. The fact that we won't see the deceased again forces our tears to pour. Despite our grief, we are careful not to overdo it and cause more damage to the living. Because of this, we don't invite people to come to us and grieve with us from all over the place nor we do stay indoors for days to grieve. If inviting many mourners and grieving bitterly would have brought back the deceased, we would have done it. But it will not. So we don't do what is traditionally done in other communities. Sitting for days and mourning is also seen as bad for the health of the mourners and damaging the livelihood of the deceased family and wasting precious work time. Without undue delay, the family and friends go back to their normal life routine the day after the funeral. In short, exaggerated grieving is not allowed for the reasons I stated above. Our Amba also has its own religious philosophy that makes it stand out from other societies. Not an educated person. Yet I ask questions. I ask religion teachers. What is the reason for diverse types of religion or faith is? Instead of giving me explanations, they prefer to try and convert me to their particular type of faith. I tell them that I won't do that as I have given myself to all humanity and it isn't correct to anchor myself to one religion. If I belong to a specific faith, I will be losing all other faith-based followers. Anyway, I ask them how many different gods there are for you to have so many religious denominations. I always reply that there is only one God. If their reply is that only their God is real then my response is that I believe in one universal God, not in the many versions created by men. I tell them that I have no objection to people believing in different religions. In fact, we support the local community when they build churches or mosques, but we will not build one in our community as we believe that God exists everywhere where human beings exist. We don't have any conflict with all the many religious denominations or religions in general. In fact, what we do practice in Ora Amba is what is prescribed by most religions. If all the faithful of all religion live by and practice this path of truth then peace will reign on earth we believe in one God and others also believe in one God. If that is the case we are willing to join them in front of that one God. Outside the realms of social and economic spheres, another thing that stands out within the society is the organisation of the family home. The average family member dwells in a well-organised home that is built of locally available materials like mud and sticks. Compared to other homes in the surrounding area, the quality of these homes is far superior, providing separate living, cooking, sleeping and bathing facilities, as well as entertainment for the family. Every home has access to water and electricity. Every family has been relieved from a smoke-filled environment where baking bread and cooking meals takes place in open fires in the middle of the room where children and family are subject to constant tears and choking from the smoke. What you see here is our fuel-saving and smoke-free stove. The stove is Dr. Zumra's invention. The idea behind it is to save fuel and thereby reduce tree cutting, to safeguard kids from fire burns and also protect parents and kids from smoke-related illnesses. Our parents had told us initially they were using the traditional stove which is just three medium-sized stones arranged in the form of a triangle on the ground. After they met Zumra he showed them how to build and use this modernized stove. Today all households in Arumba are using it. As you can see you can do three things at the same time on the stove. You can bake and here, 
make a stew there and brew tea here. The smoke from the stove goes through this chimney stack made out of mud and stone to the outside. This part can be used for two purposes when baking and making stew it can be used for brewing tea. On the hand when the stack is blocked with soot you can insert a sweeping rod to clean it. There was a third use for the chimney, but we are not using it now because we have tin roofs. In the old days when we had thatched roofs, we used to open the chimney and let the smoke out to kill insects and get rid of dampness. All 144 households are using this type of stove. All members of the community undertake two kinds of work on a daily basis. The first one is the collective work that all able-bodied adults have to engage in for the benefit of the whole community. This takes place every day except on Sunday, the day of rest. The other is private work that individuals undertake when they are not working for the community. Anyone who is a member of the community is automatically a member of the Auramba Community Farmers and Handicrafts Cooperative. Their numbers are now in excess of 300. The members of the coup all share the philosophy of the intentional community and have to be deployed in one of the many economic activities run by the cooperative. The cooperative has over 30 different projects where members spend their work days. Members work in one of these work areas according to their abilities. Between 8am in the morning and 5pm in the afternoon, members give their labour their skills and knowledge for six days a week. All production and income that results from such work are collectively owned. All members are entitled to an equal share of the profit from this income, irrespective of the type of work they undertake. In our amber, there are no income differentials based on education, experience, age or types of profession undertaken. All families earn sufficient income to cover their living and other expenses in this way. This income has enabled families to feed their families without any food insecurity, to live in a house with electricity and clean water supplies, educate their children up to the university level and look after their elders in old age in a comfortable community care home. Members of the community have been free from the ravages of hunger and the insecurity of life that we know afflicts many rural and urban Ethiopians. In addition, Members of the community can engage in any profitable private economic activity in their spare time in the evenings, including Sundays, to generate additional income. Some families have used the income from such work to modernise their homes, which every family owns, to buy capital goods for the home and send their children to further studies away from the community all over the country and sometimes abroad. This seamless synergy between private gain and public wealth seems to be a unique answer by the intentional community to the age-old universal problem of how to reconcile these seemingly conflicting activities that have baffled humanity for centuries under different types of economic and political systems. In our amber, the individual lives for the community and the community nurtures the individual. One of the unique features of the society that illustrates the love and care that exists among members of this community is the spontaneous gathering of all members at the beginning and the end of the day in the public square where people meet and greet each other and inquire after their well-being on a daily basis. Before their deployment to their place of work every morning, members flock to this square known as the town gate for an informal gathering. This spontaneous assembly is where members find out if their fellow humans had a quiet and peaceful night, if any problems had emerged during the night that need the attention of others, etc. In this early morning conclave, any subject can be brought up for discussion, including personal health and welfare. In the meetings held in our amber, all members including young and old, men and women, young people and the elderly, layperson and those with higher education, can freely express their views on any matter with equality and respect. One white man thought he had a challenge for me. He said you claim humanity is one. But some say man has come for monkeys. I said you did not bring anything only a saying. Should we waste our time on hearsay? Okay, 
Let me grant you that we have come from monkeys. Let the monkey be our grandfather. The grandfather of Adam and Eve, and as long as we agree on that, our kinship can continue. The monkey won't be a problem. During such meetings, sometimes ideas that could become big projects can come up for discussion. It could be an idea that one of the members had a sleepless night about, that needs the attention of the group, and there is no better opportunity than the morning get together to collectively trash out the concept. The way this community is structured is amazing. As you have witnessed, people gather here informally at six in the morning, greet each other. In this meeting, a new project idea may be put forward by someone. If the project idea sounds reasonable by eight a.m., a formal gathering will be called to discuss the new idea, and then one of the thirteen committees will be assigned to look into it in depth. By nine a.m., another general meeting will be called. Then by 10 a.m. budget will be allocated to the project. By 11 a.m. the implementation begins. Just like its focus on education, another area which has received the attention of the members is the question of health. In the past, when the community was passing through its many trials and tribulations, it lost many of its members to many types of diseases and illnesses. This experience has forced them to focus on health and to organise themselves better to meet this challenge and give its due priority. In our amber, health starts at home and in the wider environment in which they live and work, with a campaign of sanitation and cleanliness. What distinguishes our amber from the surrounding rural communities is the level of general sanitation and cleanliness at home and outside it. This reality explains the fact that one of the twelve committees that help run the community is named the Water and Environmental Sanitation Committee. Due to this emphasis, great effort has been spent on making sure that sufficient, clean, and potable water is available for domestic use and for supplying all work-related needs. Due to this emphasis, great effort has been spent on making sure that sufficient, clean, and potable water. Is available for domestic use and for supplying all work-related needs. In the main, our amber has won the fight against life-threatening disease, and as part of this effort, has set up a medium-level clinic called Paradise on Earth. The building which houses this clinic, as well as all its internal equipment and facilities, were funded by the hard-earned resources of the community. Even so, this clinic serves the residents of the ten outlying rural settlements around the community. Also, this clinic is run by the sons and daughters of the people of Our Amber that the community has educated. The clinic is headed by a highly trained medical professional, trained to an ISO level, which is almost equivalent to a surgeon. The staff include a health officer, a nurse, a laboratory technician, a patient records worker. A pharmacist and a cleaner. One of the most powerful demonstrators of the moral high ground of the Our Amber experience is the general description that these workers provide about the kind of work they do in this clinic and the philosophy behind it, as well as the actual service they provide to the surrounding population. Our service focuses not on money but on human beings. The way we were brought up and made to understand we should give priority to human beings, as professionals. We could have earned more in private and public health centers. Instead of that, we decided to come here and serve our community. Here, we don't have a salary or the perks professionals get at the state health centers. We earn what everyone earns when the community divides equally its profit to all members. The challenge we face here is to see people coming here sick. They want us to make them well. There are illnesses we cannot cure here. People must go to a higher clinic or a hospital, but they could not afford to go. We cannot help the as well. It is depressing. There are moments when patients lose their life because they don't have the money to go somewhere else and get treatment. To witness the passing of human life for lack of funds is mentally disturbing. The reason why we are good at serving patients that come here is related to our being born and brought up in Zumra and taught by Zumra, taught us to have a high moral standard and to give respect and value to human life. With our modest training, even 
it is to the highest level we try to serve our clients to make them go away happy from our clinic. The clinic has short and long-term goals. In the short term, the standard of the clinic is as it is, designated medium standard clinic by the authorities if we get ultrasound, x-ray, CVC machine, and a better microscope one specialist and GP doctor we could meet the health challenges facing all the communities around us. The economic history of the community, which includes the mobilisation of all adults to be cotton processors, spinners and weavers, are still very much alive today. However, our amber has now managed to break out of this stereotype and has become a land of many diverse economic activities. Among the many impressive such activities is this large modern warehouse, a capacity of 3,500 tonnes built for one of the most fascinating projects that have came out of this community. The building is one of the four pillars of the unique basic income project of Our Amber, encompassing fund allocation, determining annual consumption needs and purchasing, transportation and storage, and finally distribution. Each family submits almost all the ingredients of its annual consumption needs, such as grains and cereals, spices, chilies, and even firewood to the special committee set up for this purpose. The purchasing team consolidates this order and procures supplies from all over the region and stores them in this giant warehouse before distributing them. The purchasing team funds its activities not from funds collected from those who have placed the orders, but from communal funds set aside for this purpose, with the hope of clawing it back at the end of 12 months when profit distribution to members actually takes place. Through years of experience, the purchasing team has been distinguished experts in cereals, pulses, grains, spices and many other items of consumption in knowing what to buy, when and where to buy them and at what price. So the members are able to benefit from this market-based specialisation, getting the best quality products at the least possible prices. Because these total annual family food needs are met a year in advance without having to pay for them until you have earned the money to do so at the end of the year, they have the full elements of the basic income movement which exists in Western societies, at least in the theoretical realm. All you need to do to qualify is to be a member. That is just to be a human being, the most valued attribute in our AMBA society. These citizens never have to worry about availability, price fluctuations, inflation, transport costs, the quality of the product and the money to pay for it. It illustrates the degree to which the community has been able to remove food insecurity and the stress that goes with it. Today in our amber, famine has been eliminated. There are no great differences between the quality of food that people get in different families and consequently, the void left by the removal of food insecurity and the death of the rat race has been filled by matters of concern to people that are relatively affluent, such as peace, love and brotherhood among humanity, and good environmental stewardship and bringing happiness and a good education for the future generation. Today, our Amber Society has transitioned away from solely focusing on weaving and textiles to new fields of economic activity. During the last few years, the Our Amber community has charted a five-year growth and transformation plan and is moving ahead with the implementation of this roadmap. In order to simplify the organisation of its economic activity, it has structured its economic agents in five institutions. The first of these is the Our Amber Cooperative. It undertakes manufacturing activity, commercial retail and distribution, commercial crop production, cattle fattening, poultry farms, flour mills, corner shops, warehousing and logistics and other activities. In total, it has over 30 projects under its umbrella, spanning the manufacturing and commerce sectors. The second is the Citizens' Welfare Organisation, organised as an NGO and running a member of flour mills in the area. The income from such activities is used to fund the needs of the elderly and other welfare activities in the community. The third economic agent is the Our Amber General Trading Share Company, owned by all the community members and incorporated with a share capital of 10 million bur. The unit is developing a large 7 hectare garment manufacturing facility 
and a 24-bed, three-star hotel in the town of Wadetta. Its other activities include a construction materials producing factory engaged in cement blocks, terrazzo tiles and compressed earth blocks production. The fourth arm is the Araamba Microfinance Institution SC under formation, with all the community members as shareholders and incorporated with the initial capital of 20 million bur. Its principal activity is to mobilise savings from the surrounding peasant farmers and make investment capital that will transform the lives of the wider community. The fifth arm is the newly established poultry cooperative with all the members of the community participating in it and capable of raising some 1,400 chickens in order to produce eggs for the local market. The sixth arm is the newly incorporated Araamba Enterprise Training Centre that aims to share the development experience of the community accumulated over the last 50 years, as well as meet the needs of the newly formed institutions such as the MFI and the AGT. The Araamba Intentional Community is fully aware of the negative social and environmental consequences of development activity that is not properly choreographed. Such chaotic development activities create unintentional losers who drop out of society or are marginalised and the community has laid the foundations for a social structure that protects the young, the old and the infirm, those with mental and physical illnesses, and is above all based on love, peace and humanity, and a shared future for all citizens. Our Amber Society and its members cut their teeth with a deep sense of love and care for the environment right from the word go. This meant that nature is rightfully protected from wanton destruction that could come with rapid development from the market and other forces who are blindsided by their search for a living and daily bread as well as for profit. What is our Amber's view regarding the environment? I guess without a clear view it would have been impossible to see this vegetation around. The surrounding area is almost treeless. Yes, we are doing this with a little land, land that is not even big enough to rest our back, we have. As we do respect human beings, we are doing our best to give respect to trees as well. Trees have many uses they are keepers of the health of the environment, some are sources of food giving us various fruits, and some are sources of medicine, because we don't have the knowledge, we don't properly appreciate trees. Their uses are many. Nature created trees, it created them just like animals. Because they are useful that they are with us. We need to look after them as we look after ourselves and other animals. On my part, I have a great affection for trees. Even when I see them swaying with the wind, I feel that they are dancing. Trees had done me a personal favor. When I left my parents' home looking for people that will share my vision, they were my source of food and my shelter. I have heard this green hat on your head is a symbolic gesture to express your love for plants in general. Is it true? Yes. For five years trees have served me well. To show how much I feel about them I have this green hat all the time. Another story I heard is you have advised the Araamba community to abandon harmful traditions related to trees. What were they? Yes, the community used to cut leaves and branches of trees unnecessarily. I told them this is not the way to respect the environment. All of them used to cut leaves from the trees to use them as makeshift lid for their water jars when they went to the river to fetch water. That was bad for the trees. Imagine a whole village going to the river twice a day doing these. Trees will not have the chance to thrive, so I told them to use other materials to cover their pots with, such as keel. There was a practice of using tree leaves as a bed when storing injera, the baked flatbread, that too was abandoned and replaced with corn, beans, and chickpea seeds. Is the community obligated to plant trees regularly? Really, it is not an obligation. People here have a love for trees. They know how important trees are to the overall well-being and development of the community. Members have gladly incorporated in their guiding principles the planting of trees. Married couples, when they wed, plant two trees each. They do that without any enforcement agency to oversee them. There are healthy competitions between different couples to succeed in planting and nurturing trees. You mean a husband plants two trees and a wife likewise? Yes.
We have that written in our bylaw. The problem is land. Whenever land is available, we do it. In short, this is the kind of society that our Amba has now become. After 50 years of following Zumra's philosophy, it has reached this current stage. The dream of Zumra has always been to overcome the countless trials and tribulations that they face in this long journey on numerous occasions, and to reach that magical point in space and time when more educated people could adopt this message of hope and peace and make it their own dream so that it could have a chance to reach a much wider audience. A few people have started listening to him. Some have organised themselves under the banner of Aramba Community Cooperative of Farmers and Handicrafts New Chapter. This community accepts all members of the human community as members. The people of Aramba are now coming back to the unscripted daily conclave at the end of the workday. Zumra, seated in his usual place by the gate, greets them and asks them how their days have passed. Darkness is casting its shadows on the Aramba settlement. As usual, Zumra, on behalf of this amazing community, talks about his message of hope and peace for all mankind. You think this view of yours that looks at all humanity as one family where deceit and mischief have disappeared and truth has prevailed and where hate is replaced by love and on top of this, where the world is freed from hunger, war and diseases, where enlightenment has spread all throughout Ethiopia and the wider world? will be a reality? If we strive for peace and the well-being of humanity, yes, it is possible. Especially these days, our problems are worsening daily. We are being shocked. What choice do we have? We have to ask the hard question of what to do. Do you believe people will turn to your philosophy? As many are telling me my view can be a way out. 